One, our third lesson as we walk through how it works, found in the big book on page 58. And I just want to read a part of it. It says, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have a capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. And this is the part where we at now, where it talks about as some of these we balk. And we have looked at this each week and we said that this is the instruction manual to the program. Anytime you, you buy something and you try to put it together in the box, is an instruction manual. What most of us try to do, instead of reading instructions, we try to look at the picture. And all the time, the picture don't tell the true story. So, if you look at your handout or look at the screen, it says part of the reasons we can be afraid of recovery is that we know the changes God asks us to make will be painful. There, are, there was pain in our old way of life, but we usually found ways to escape it. When we decided to enter the recovery process, we also decided to face change head on. And we talked about that a little bit this morning and talked about that pain and ch change hurts. That's why we are afraid of it. And we get so comfortable in our old ways that it stops hurting. It's this thing called adaptability. Although it may have been painful, we adapted to it. And we got used to it and got comfortable. And so now when we try to change our lives, it seems as if it will be more painful than the destruction of addiction. Even the jails and the institutions and the homelessness and all of that, you would think that that would be painful. And it is, but we get used to it. That makes sense? And so when it comes time to change, that seems like that is more painful than the situation we're in. Les Brown, in, in one of his motivational speeches, he, he says a friend, he talks about this guy that comes to visit a friend, and there is a dog that's sitting on the porch, and the dog is just hollering. Ha! Ha! And he's like, man, what's wrong with your dog? He said, he's sitting on a nail. He said, man, get him up. He said, no, when he gets tired of hurting, he'll get up. And that's the way it is with recovery. When you will see somebody, obviously in a whole bunch of pain, but until that person gets ready to get up, ain't nothing you can do for them. And that's the hard part of this thing because it's painful for the family members to see but the addict themselves have gotten used to it. And it don't even bother them no more. And so that's what this is talking about. And some of these we bought, we stopped. And if you look, 1 Peter 3 and 17 says, Remember, if God wants you to suffer, it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing wrong. Amen. Remember, if God wants you to suffer, it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing wrong. See, we got this thing in this health and wealth and prosperity gospel that people are, are preaching and teaching that says that it's not any pain in following God. That's not true. God allows us to get into 
painful situations. Matter of fact, last week we said that that is God's prescription for growth. Yeah. Is allowing us to go through things. And so, we got to learn from the mistakes. And sometimes God puts us in it. But I do know this. It is better to suffer for doing good than suffering behind the consequences of doing something wrong. Yeah. Rip Shelley, the first director of the program, used to say it like this. He said, either way it go, you're going to suffer. He said, it's better to suffer and not do than suffer and do. See, it may take some suffering for me not to get high, but it is better for me to suffer and not get high than to go out there and get high and then suffer. That make sense? Yes. That's what we got to learn. And some of these we balked. That's why I stopped that when I was reading the big book. And balk just means stop. Some of the changes that we got to make, we stop at that point. Why? Because we said that they're painful and it's uncomfortable. The first one said, we balk because we don't trust God. That's the first reason why we balk is because we don't trust God. What do you mean? Because all the time God doesn't make the whole process lay it all out for us. So we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, right? And so we don't do it. We say stuff like this. I, I will trust you, God, if you tell me exactly what's going to happen. That's what we want. They're like, no, oh, man, I, I don't want to give this up. I don't want to let this go because I don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's where faith feels in. You know, and if God told us all of the things that were going to happen, we wouldn't keep moving forward. You know that? That's right. If you knew everything that was going to happen in your life, you wouldn't keep moving forward. Some things he can't tell us. You know, it's like when you, when you get some news and you have to figure out, should I tell this to somebody? And sometimes you're like, no, they ain't mature enough to handle whatever. That's why I tell feminine ones all the time, stop sharing everything that's going on on outside of this treatment center with your loved one that's here. They can't handle it. You have to be, you have to use some wisdom in what you share with us when we're in treatment. I have wives and girlfriends be, oh, I'm broke. I don't know what I'm going to do. Now, what is a man going to do with that? But I want you to stay. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. I want you to stay. Hey, brother, go leave. You know, oh, I'm so lonely. I don't know what I'm going to do. No. <laughs> he coming home or she coming home. Right? So sometimes you can't share everything that's going on with everybody. Sometimes that's not being kind. You know? Yeah. That's not being kind. The second reason is we balk because change hurts. Change hurts. Because when we make all of these changes and let this stuff go, we it starts out, I got to let this go, I got to let this go, I got to let this go. It's the replacing of all of the stuff that hurts and that's so odd. See, when I stop running the streets and I stop getting high and I stop doing those things, I had to figure out what I was going to do with all this newfound time. Because I just focused on what I was going to let go of and just trying to be normal, whatever that is, was painful to me. Because letting go is hurtful. I told, told the men and the women this morning, we're going to write some letters next week. We're going to write some letters to our drug of choice. We're going to write some letters to our old lifestyle because you got to grieve some of that stuff. See, when you just say, oh, just stop, let this go. Well, you've been in a love affair with this. You've been used to this. It, it, it just don't go away. Some of us are trying to get out of a, you know, a relationship. You don't just, just say, oh, okay, this ain't working for me. I'm going to let it go. It ain't that easy all the time, right? Yeah. You say, what? Yeah, you need closure. So we're going to get some closure. We're going to say goodbye 
and we're going to do some crying and we're going we're gonna to try to grieve this thing because it leaves a void. But change hurts. It does. Secondly, thirdly, I mean, we balk because of fear. We balk because of fear. The big book says we're driven by a hundred forms of fear. And it's not talking about big dogs and snakes either. Now, we may be afraid of big dogs and snakes, but this ain't the fear that it's talking about. It's the fear of the unknown. We're afraid of the unknown. What's going to happen? Or sometimes we're afraid of what we know is going to happen. I was afraid of being thought of as a square. You know, because I thought living right made me weak. And so I was afraid of the perception of being weak. We got a whole bunch of fears. One of the sisters this morning said she's afraid of failure. She, freaked, she feared failure. And so if I fear failure, you know what that does? That makes me not try so hard because I'm afraid to put a whole bunch of effort in because I don't think it's going to work. See, when you, when you don't think something is going to work, you don't try that hard, right? right. But if you think it's going to work, you'll put a little more effort in. And, and I figured out that fear, it either paralyzes or it motivates. It either paralyzes or it motivates. And, and so a lot of times because I am afraid, it's paralyzes me. I stay stuck because I'm afraid to put some effort in. Or my fear can motivate me. In the end, my fear motivated me and it motivated me to go to meetings. It motivated me to go to church. It motivated me to call my sponsor and read the stuff because I was afraid not to because I knew what was going to happen if I did. So I started out working the program out of fear of falling off. And then I learned to like and love what I was doing. Then I had a different motivation, but it wasn't necessarily a motivation of, I love this. It was just, I know I didn't want what I had just left from. Yeah. And I was scared to go back. And so that's fear. We bought because we're, we're afraid. You know, when, when, when people are climbing, climbing, people like me who are afraid of heights, and, and I'm climbing up a ladder, Sometimes you get stuck. You ever you ever see little kids when they get up on the on the tower diving board yeah. and they're climbing up the ladder and then they'll stop or they'll get all the way up there and it be time to jump and they'll turn around and walk all the way back down the ladder. Now we know it is a lot easier to go ahead and jump, right? Than to go all the way back down, go through all of the people on the ride and all that kind of stuff. But fear will make you stop. And we got to learn to face our fears and let our fear motivate us. 1 Corinthians 1 and 4 says, When you, what are you so puffed up about? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why act as though you are so great? And as though you have accomplished something on your own. And so a lot of times, y'all, we will start this thing and we get a little sobriety and, and we get puffed up and start to say, I got this. And we balk again because we think we got it made. I don't need to go to meetings no more. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to do these things. I'm good the way I am. No. We're all clean by grace. I got 24 years clean, but I don't work a program deserving of sobriety. I'm sober by the grace of God. Amen. Yeah. And you will be too. And so that kind of helps us not to get the big head. And see, the big head is when I go to meetings for a little while, I leave the treatment center, and I start to say, I don't need to go back down there no more. I don't need to go to meetings. I don't need the fellowship. I don't need to go to church. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. That's some arrogance there to say, I don't need the fellowship no more because I got 
eight months clean. You better come to yourself. This is a one day at a time for the rest of your life process. And that's what it is. And we just got to keep moving forward. And I, I never understood when, when believers say that. Because think about it this way, y'all. The greatest mission field is to go to the meeting. So we're supposed to be making disciples. What better place can I go than where there's a whole bunch of atheists and agnostics and people saying the do knob is a God? Where is a Christian supposed to be? That's a good place. Everybody's supposed to be, isn't it? Yeah. And I ain't got to go with no big King James Bible. I can just go and just walk out my salvation where people can see it. And if they just so happen to ask me, then I can let them know. My God, my high power, which I choose to call God and all of the stuff that we say, right? You know, I ain't got to break the traditions, but that's a great place to be. It says, we thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. See, we're always looking for an easier, softer way to do this because we think the program is too hard and too much. That's why we, that's why we balk, y'all, because think about it. You balk because you think we're asking you to do too much. <laughs> Man, I can't go to all of those meetings. I can't do all of that. That's too much. It's a lot easier to do all of the things they talk about in recovery than it is to be out there smoking. They say if I put half the amount of effort in the staying clean that I put in to getting high, I'd be a lot better off. Mm -hmm. It takes a whole lot of effort to get high. Oh, yeah, that's hard work. <laughs> getting high, leaving with two hundred dollars and smoking up two thousand dollars—that's that's hard work. So this is easy, y'all. So there is no easy to solve the way. The easier salt the way is the program. That's easier and softer. Y'all got it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know easier salt the way. Just do it the way it's designed. That's why it's called how it works. This is the instruction manual. Just you just gotta go step by step because it says rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And so we just gotta work the program the way it's designed and trust the process. I'm going to ask three rhetorical questions. That means you don't have to answer, but just think about it. What do you think you, why do you think you can stay sober on your own? Why do you think you can stay sober on your own when you got all of this history that shows that you can't do this? So what makes you think after you done failed a hundred times that this time you can do it your way. You would think that now you would throw your hands up and say, I surrender. I do whatever y'all ask me to do. You know, the old preachers and deacons used to pray and they used to say, we're praying that somebody will come down, running down the aisle, begging and crying, asking, what must I do to be saved? That's how we're supposed to come to the program. We're supposed to come to the program asking, what must I do? Not telling the people what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I interviewed a client this week, and he talked the whole time. Every time I would say something, he had all of the answers. I said, man, I don't think this is for you. He said, why? I said, you know everything. Mm -hmm. Treatment is for people that don't have no answers, and they're looking for a solution. But if you got all the answers, you keep doing what you're doing. You're like, well, man, I'm homeless, and I'm this, that. I said, but you're too smart. Because every time I say something, you're like, no, man. You know, this is the way you do it. So, oh, no, buddy. No, you go out there, finish getting high, and come back and see me when you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Them, them kind of people we work with is people that don't know. Some of y'all done worked on a job and you, you get somebody and they have a whole bunch of experience at their last company 
and then they come to your company and all they want to tell you is about the way they used to do it over there. And you be want to say, you know what? You should have stayed over there. But here we're going to do it this way. Not about all that other stuff. And that's the way treatment is. I used to have all the answers, so I thought, but they kept leading me. That's why they say, let me say it this way. They say, my best thinking got me here. And my best ideas got me here. And so what we have to understand is, is that I don't know nothing when it comes to staying clean. That don't mean that you don't know how to work on a car, you know how to work on a car, or whatever your skill set is, you know that. But what you don't know is how to stay clean. That's why you come to places like this. Number two, what do you have that God hasn't given you? What do you have? See, we, we got to understand that what we have comes from God because he owns the, the cattle of a thousand hills, and Pastor Smith used to say, and the hill that they stand on. And so whatever I have, he gave it to me. Whatever knowledge I have, he gave it to me. And so if I can believe that, then guess what? The things that I need, he'll give them to me in the future. That makes sense? And so we can learn to trust it. Number three, why are you taking credit for whom, what, and where you are in life? See, we take credit for some things that don't belong to us. You know, I got this, and I got that, or I done this. No, not really. You can't do dope and have nothing. You know, you know sometimes we have good support systems that hold us up. Y'all with me? Yeah. You, know, you, know, you know, our kids do well. It wasn't because of you, because you can't be a good parent doing dope. But sometimes we have a good support system, and then sometimes God just bless. God just bless. I was reading and, and watched this movie a few years ago where this, where this young sister, her story was from homelessness to heart. Well, she was homeless all her life, living in shelters, but where her mom would take her every day, she would take her to the library. That's where they would hang out. And so all the little girl done was just read. Well, that's the grace of God. That, that being in the shelter with all of the craziness that go along with homelessness, she still was able to get an education that would get her a full ride in the harbor. You know that's grace. Because you can, you can be raised in a, in a great environment and still not be able to, to, to get that. That's grace. And she understood that. Matthew 6 and 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And what we have to learn to do in this thing called recovery is to, my priority should be God, recovery, then me, and then all those other things will be added to me. I just need to focus on trying to stay clean. I don't need to be worrying about my family. I don't need to be worrying about no job, no right. car, none of the rest of that stuff. Right. I just need to be focusing on trying to stay clean. Right. God will add the rest of that stuff to me in time. You know, we come here and we be at month one worrying about jobs and, and running to the phone trying to raise children from the treatment center and trying to manage our house. You, forget that. They gonna be all right. They gonna be all right. They've been all right all along. You wasn't doing it when you out there. You know, now I can leave them to go get high, but I can't leave them to go get clean. Ain't that something? <laughs> Come home, take care of your kid. I ain't, I'm gonna go get high. But now I'm in treatment, now I'm trying to micromanage the house. <laughs> Leave the people alone. Yeah. That phone is one of the worst things. That phone in treatment centers get people in trouble. 
because it keeps you connected to the outside. And we want everybody's life to stop because ours has stopped. Family members, don't y'all stop living because your loved one is in here. You go on and have a merry good time. Yeah. Because what we want you to do is just sit at home and wait for six months. Because I went and got high. You ain't supposed to go and do nothing. You ain't supposed to have no fun. You can't go to the movies. Don't go out to eat. Don't do nothing. You, cause, you know, you need to be available. And answer the phone by the second ring. If you get to three, then that's a problem. What you doing? Where you been? Where you at? Right? Yeah, yeah. They're supposed to sit there. Don't y'all just sit there. Go and do your thing. It'll be all right. Maybe that'll be some motivation for us. You know, because if I'm that scared, then maybe I need to get right. You know, you know yeah. Not you. It may actually leave this time. I might need to get clean. Yeah. That's how you go check traps. You check traps by getting clean and treating people right. You can't be out getting high checking traps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You want to keep them? Get clean. Yeah. With all the urgencies at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. And I love that. He says, with all the urgencies at our command, we beg of you. So they were begging. It's a different kind of begging, y'all, than what, we, what family members used to do when before we came threatened, not that kind of begging. I plead with y'all family members every day. But I'll put them out. But we do beg them. Come on, do this. One of my favorite things is I want y'all to get this. I want them to get clean so bad. But they gotta want it the same. What I found out is there's a whole bunch of people that benefit from me getting clean. But can't nobody want me to be clean more than me? If my wife want me to be clean more than me, that's a problem. If my kids want me to be clean more than me, that's a problem. That's why I ask almost all the time when, when somebody, when family members bring their loved one here, I ask, who wants you to be clean the most? You or your mom? or you and your wife, or you and your kids, you or your daddy, and when they say, my mama, I say, you're not ready. You need to go to, and go out there and experience some pain so that you'll want to get clean more than anybody else. Now, a lot of people will benefit from it, and a lot of people love us and want us to get clean, but I got to do this for myself. Recovery is too hard to do it for somebody else, even if you love them. It's too much sacrifice. And addicts are too selfish. We can't do all of this for somebody. We selfish people. I ain't gonna get up and go to meetings and deny myself all of the stuff for you. I love my wife and kids, but you know, now come on now. They all right. It's a lot to stay clean. Because guess what? If I'm doing it for them, that means they got to do what I say, when I say, how I say it, all the time. And when they don't, I ain't going to do it for them no more. Some of y'all done got high behind that, right? Because you was doing it for somebody, and then they stop doing what you want them to do, and you say, I'll show you. I'm going to go and get high. That's why I got to do it for me. Because... Kids don't always do what you want them to do. Parents don't always do what you want them to do. Mates don't always do what you want them to do. And then, when they ain't acting right, now what's your motivation? You know? Yeah. When the wife brother stop cooking and 
Stop doing the other stuff you wanted. You know, stop all the other stuff. Then, then, then what, what's your motivation going to be then? Because you was only doing it for her. See, doing it for someone else means that I control you. Or they control me. But when I do it for me, I can say, I am staying clean for me. No wife, no wife, no job, no job, no children, no children. I'm staying clean for me. Because people leave anyway. Kids grow up, they grow up to leave. And if they don't leave quick enough, after a while, you want them to leave. I told my kids from the time they were little, I said, you get 18 years and 60 days in my house. 18 years and 60 days. I don't know where you're going, but you're going somewhere. So I do all alone. I want it mine to go. Yeah, empty nesting is a wonderful thing. I'm an empty nester and it is just wonderful. I love them. But I don't want them to stay with me. You know, you can love somebody and not want them to stay with you, right? Yeah, yeah. And one thing. So they, they, they have to go. And so, but I love them. And I, they, they love me. They want me to stay clean. But they don't want me to stay clean more than me. Hope that makes sense to you. In closing, in recovery, we say we have to let go of old people, old places, and old things. But we keep the same friends, go to the same places, do the same things. But we come to treatment with a puzzled look on our face as to what happened when we relapsed back in the old behavior. You see that? Let's flush that out a little bit. It says, in recovery, we say we have to let go of old people, places, and things. Y'all, we have to put some, be specific. I can't say, I need to let go of old people. No, I need to put some names on those people. Because those are specific people that I got to let go of. It is specific places that I can't go no more. Just saying, oh, I got... I got to let go of old places. No, what are those places? See, I need to let my family know. I need to let, I need to let my support system know that, hey, man, I don't need to go over blank. I don't need to be fooling with whoever. You know, sometimes our family already know. They've been knowing a long time who were places you didn't need to go to and people you didn't need to be around. But I got to accept it. I had to put some names on it. And sometimes... The people I had to let go of was the closest people to me. Yeah. And people I enjoyed their company the most. But I had to let them go for sobriety's sake. And I show like them places. And still like them. I just don't go to them no more. And some of them things. There are some things that I can't do anymore. One of the brothers was talking about this morning about certain music. See, sometimes some music, that's why we tell them around here we only listen to gospel music or jazz with no words. Because we want them, because some music is a trigger. It may not be a trigger for one person, but it may be a trigger for another one. So we don't have it all blasting in, in, the, in the place. Because it's a trigger. And there are some things. I struggle, shoot. We, we go to the movies every now and then. We have to be careful what movies we take them to because, you know, when you're in treatment for six months and you can't go nowhere, you probably don't need to be going seeing a movie with a whole bunch of sex scenes and a whole bunch of drug use because that's a trip. Right? So we got to find something that, so it's some things we can't, we can't go and see. One of my favorite movies, and I don't watch it no more, is New Jack City. But I don't watch that because they just smoke too much crack in that movie. I got my eyes closed through the whole movie, like, you know, because I can't sit there and watch it. So I don't even watch it. Great movie, but it's a trigger for me. Certain places, certain things, we got to stop. But don't be puzzled when you fall off if you don't let none of this stuff go. 
Because if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting, right? They said the definition of insanity is what? There you go. One more time. Insanity is what? Yeah. If nothing changes, nothing changes. And so, y'all, we got to change that stuff. I know you like it. That's why we're going to write those letters this week and saying goodbye to some of this stuff. And you got to grieve it. It's a loss. That's why we don't, we don't change. It's because we don't grieve the loss of that stuff. We say it's not a big deal, but it is, y'all. It was hard for me to let go of some of my friends. And sometimes it was some of my family members. It was hard for me to let go of some of the places because that was all I knew. Then, some of those things. Boredom, and I'm about to close, is a big deal. We talked about that today. See, when I let go of all of that stuff, then I get bored because I've let go of everything and I gotta learn how to replace it with things. My favorite promise in the big book is I comprehend the word serenity and I know peace. I comprehend the word serenity and I know peace. What that mean? The NA text says it like this that we don't know how to live outside of calamity and chaos. And so I'm really not bored. I'm experiencing peace. But I have never been at peace, so I don't know what it is. And like I said last week, we just got to learn how to go somewhere and sit down somewhere. And do nothing. And, and learn how to be bored and be all right. Now, for normal people, a day like today with nothing to do is a good day. Normal people look for a day when they ain't got nothing to do. We go crazy because we ain't got nothing to do. We got to learn how to enjoy a day when we ain't just got nothing to do and just learn how to sit down somewhere and be okay. You're not bored. I don't get bored. That's one of the things the big book said that's a promise. I can sit and do nothing. And I have to learn to do some things sometimes because I can get stuck. Here, I can get stuck. I can just go do nothing. I can remember. Oh, well, maybe I may need to take my wife out or something and do something because I can do nothing with the best of them. I don't need no entertainment. I can just sit and do nothing. And I'll be and be having fun. Told my wife when we was dating, I said, you know what? I am looking for somebody I can do nothing with and enjoy it. I'm not necessarily looking for somebody that I can have a whole bunch of fun with because that's easy to find. You know, you can find a whole bunch of entertaining people out there, but you got to kind of like somebody to sit around with them all the time and do nothing. Yeah. So that's what I was looking for, somebody I could do nothing with. Because I like to do nothing. <laughs> and y'all may better learn how to do nothing. Because you can't go and entertain yourself all the time. It costs money to be going all the time. And so you got to learn how to have some peace doing nothing. You know, run the streets, get you in trouble. See, I had to learn how to have some money and sit down somewhere. I had to learn how to have a car and let it stay parked in the, in the That's garage. Right. That's right. That's you right. You know, and not be like I was when I was a little kid. My mama used to tell me, boy, you get 50 cents and it just burn your pocket. You know, I would be a nervous wreck. You know, I get 50 cents. I'm running back and forth buying moon cookies and windmill cookies and now later. And then when I got broke, I could sit down somewhere. But as long as I had some money, I had to go run up to the candy house and buy something. But when I came in here at 28, I was still the same. If I had a car and some money or just some money, I had to go. 
Y'all might need to learn how to have a car and some money and sit down somewhere. Ain't nothing wrong with going, but what I've learned is I got to have a destination and a purpose or I don't go nowhere. Because riding aimlessly gets me in trouble. That's what I used to love to do. Wash my car and just turn some blocks. Where are you going? I don't know. I'm just going to turn some blocks. I don't know where I'm going to end up. And that used to be fun. But now, if I ain't got somewhere in mind to go, I go home. And I go exactly where I say I'm going. And back. Not just turning corners. That's why we practice around here going from point A to point B. We got to learn how to do it. If I say I'm, I'm going to my doctor's appointment and coming back, that means I'm going to my doctor's appointment and coming back. That don't mean I'm going to meet my girlfriend downtown for lunch or I'm going to run by here because, well, my past, they going to think I'm going to be gone for four hours, so I'm going to go to three or four different places. No. It's called integrity. I need to go exactly where I'm saying I'm going to go and come back. And practice that or you're going to get in trouble. Last one. In recovery, in the recovery process, we have to let go. Absolutely is what it says. I have to learn to let go. Absolutely. That means completely, y'all. And then you trust the process and trust what God is going to do in your life. But you got to let that stuff go. You got to let them people go. You know, you make it relate to this. You know how you, how you uh, be in a relationship and y'all break up and you say, but you don't want in love. And she said, we can still be friends, but she going to still call you sometime and still want to hang out. But you know. She may be able to do that, or he, and you can't do it. Because being around them and hearing from them throw you off. Yeah. Get your feelings all in a whack. So sometimes you just got to say, you know what? I'm going to have to delete your number. I'm going to have to let you go absolutely. Because being around you affect me. And that's the way it is with those old people, old places, and old things. You just got to let that stuff go. Absolutely. And learn how to embrace this new life. It's a lifestyle change, y'all. But we do recover. Amen. People get clean around here. Yeah. In high numbers. We really do. People get clean. And so you can do this. You just got to follow the path. And then you'll get it.